As the year is now nearing to a close, I decided to take a look at some of the worst contracts so far of the season. You may recall what we did touch on this past August in the offseason, but since a good portion of the current campaign has gone by, some things have changed since. For instance, Eric Carlson has been proving everyone wrong and will not be featured on this list. Anyways, in case you're new to this sort of thing, we're going to be going over a list of players that aren't earning their keep per se so far this season. We'll be going over stats and a detailed analysis of each corresponding contract. And with that, here are the top nine worst contracts of the current NHL season. When standing amongst his peers, Elvis Merce Lincolns ranks as the league's worst in goals against average. It doesn't take a genius to realize that Columbus hasn't had the greatest season thus far. After signing Johnny Hockey in the offseason, the overall vibe in Ohio's capital seemed to be one of optimism moving forward. Unfortunately, as I alluded to, things haven't went well at all for CBJ. Currently, while I'm making this video, they're third from the bottom league-wide and directly below Arizona, for some perspective. And when it comes to their highest paid attendee, well, just like the team as a whole, he's been having a rough go of it and save percentage simultaneously. With four wins and eight losses for Merce Lincolns, the tables have clearly turned when it comes to CBJ's tandem, as Jonas Corposalo, who has played close to the same amount of time as his goalie partner, has a .905 save percentage and a 3.43 goals against average. While they aren't the best numbers at the same time, they do support the notion that the team's performance isn't solely to blame for the netminder's struggles. What makes his contract so unsettling is the fact that it's in its infancy, as Merce Lincoln's five-year, $25 million extension just kicked in this season, meaning that if his performance continues to be lackluster, then the Jackets are going to have an albatross on their hands. Hopefully, though, the goaltender will be able to bounce back sooner rather than later. Unlike some contracts on this list, for most hockey fans, the Rasmus Ristolainen situation in Philly has fared as expected, not well. And really, the writing was already on the wall last season, that the defenseman was trending downward. Following 66 games played, Ristolainen was only able to muster up 16 points throughout. He also had 33 giveaways and 12 takeaways, which was nearly a 3 to 1 ratio. Sure, he landed some hits and blocked some shots, but as far as points were considered, Ristolainen fell short of expectations. Well, there was one man who wasn't disappointed in the slightest when it came to his performance, as GM Chuck Fletcher awarded the defenseman with a five-year deal valued at $25.5 million last spring. However, it's possible at this point in time that Fletcher wishes he could rescind that previous offer. Currently, Ristolainen has only notched a single point in 28 games played. What's even more troubling is the fact that he has a 2-to-1 ratio when it comes to giveaways and takeaways. Sure, it would make more sense if you have such a blunder on the back end if you're an offensive D-man that's trying to make plays happen and usually has the puck. But clearly, that hasn't been the case here. In case you've been under a rock or are just new to hockey, Jack Campbell has been one of the biggest disappointments so far this season. After not being able to reach an agreement with Kyle Dubas in Toronto, Campbell went to free agency last offseason. And really, if you gloss over his stats up until this season, the nutminder appeared to be starter material. Soup, as he's called, had managed to sport a .916 save percentage cumulatively during his stint in Toronto. With 48 wins during that span of time and only 12 losses, Campbell seemed to be what the Oilers needed coming in. GM Ken Holland, who had been looking desperately for a attendee he could count on, decided to sign Campbell to a five-year deal valued at $25 million. This move for many, and me personally, was rather predictable. However, once the season commenced, the goaltender's performance was anything but. In more than half of the games he suited up for on the season, Campbell has let in four or more goals. With a .876 save percentage following 15 games in the crease for the Oil, Campbell has been struggling to keep his position, as his tandem partner Stuart Skinner has outplayed him by all accounts. With that in mind, Campbell is currently making nearly twice as much as his goalie partner, which isn't ideal at all. 
To make matters worse, Campbell also has a modified no trade clause for the entirety of the deal, meaning that even if Holland wanted to move the netminder, he'd have to find a team that wasn't on Campbell's 10 team no trade list. When Roman Yossi basically helped drag his team into the postseason, he did so while making only 9 million against the cap. Therefore, to put things into perspective, Yossi recorded 96 points last campaign, while Ryan Johansson was making around a million less. Johansson, who initially was traded to Nashville from Columbus, ended up signing with the Preds in 2017. The forward, who had notched 71 points in a full season's play with CBJ, was looked to as the answer up front. And to prove it, GM David Poyle decided to sign him to an eight-year contract worth $64 million. For the most part, Johansson has fallen short throughout and has become notoriously known as possessing one of the worst deals league-wide. What does make this one a little more bearable is the fact that it expires relatively soon and has no clauses built in. With 18 points in 32 games played on the season, Johansson is currently playing on the third line. So far, he's on pace for finishing fifth on Nashville's roster for the most points. Johansson, who also finished fifth in points last season, did so while making more than Philip Forsberg and Mikhail Granlin both. After making his way to the Big Apple, Jacob Truba was signed to a seven-year, $56 million deal. The defenseman, who was just coming off a productive season with Winnipeg, was able to record 50 points after a full season's play. Therefore, for former GM Jeff Gordon, Truba seemed to be the perfect right shot D-man to add to the back ends. However, it wasn't long after the deal took effect that many began to second guess whether or not Truba was truly worth $8 million a season. In 2020, for example, an article from The Athletic suggested that Truba's contract had fallen into, quote, worst contract in the league territory, end quote. And really, up until recently, the Rangers didn't always have the most stable decor around. Part of the decline offensively for Truba could be attributed to him adjusting to a new team at the beginning as well. But there's no denying that his points have declined substantially. The 2020-21 season, for example, after 38 games played, the defenseman only produced 12 points. Currently, at the present time, Truba's production is shaping up to be about the same rates as a captain has notched 11 points after 35 games played. To give some perspective, names like Rasmus Dahlin, Josh Morrissey, and Hampus Lindholm have at least twice the points that Truba does, and are making over a million less. Currently, Truba can't be moved due to the full no move clause still in effect on his contract, but will be eligible to be traded in 2024. Last season, Sergei Bobrovsky was finally able to have a strong season for Florida. After recording a .913 save percentage and a 2.67 goals against average, Bob appeared to be finding his game. Unfortunately though, so far in this campaign, that hasn't been the case. Unlike his tandem partner, Spencer Knight, the goaltender is sporting a losing record. He also hasn't been able to compete with Knight as far as save percentage is concerned. At the present time, Bob's save percentage as a 0.895, and he's been averaging 3.29 goals per game against. Obviously, if he wasn't making seven figures a year, then we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. But along with Alexander Barkov, the netminder is making the most out of the entire team with a $10 million cap hit. What also makes this deal hard to swallow is the fact that it has a full new move clause for two more seasons and doesn't expire until 2026. It's hard to tell how Bobrovsky's game will fare by then, but most of us can agree that he's not earning his paycheck currently. For Sagan, he hasn't come close for the past two seasons to resembling the same player that once notched 80 points in a full season's play. However, the reasoning behind the sudden mediocrity could be related to the fact that, according to Sagan, he hasn't been the same since undergoing surgeries on his knee and hip. Even though he returned after receiving surgery to play last season, he was far from himself and fell just shy of scoring 50 points after 81 games played with 49. But even though we know why Sagan has fallen short, it still doesn't change the fact that his total salary for this season is an outrageous overpayment. 
Based on salary, Sagan is the highest paid player league wide at 13 million. Even though he's improved thus far with 24 points and 35 games played, the fact that Jamie Benn has been outperforming him offensively while receiving lesser ice time speaks to Sagan's decline. And to make matters worse, there's a full new move clause as well on the deal until it expires in 2027. By then, Sagan will be in his mid 30s. When Seth Jones was traded to Chicago, it was a summer for defensemen to get paid. Kale McCarr, Dougie Hamilton, and Mira Haskinen, just to name a few, were given fresh contracts, while some took effect to start the 2021-2022 campaign. Others had a later start date. And for Jones, as he signed his 8-year $72 million contract, this was a signal, at least at the time, that Chicago was serious about trying to remain competitive. Well, as most of us know, the closer the defenseman's contract came to expiring, the worse things began to appear in Chi-Town. Currently, at 28 years of age, Jones is going to be receiving a seven-figure salary for the first four years due to the contract being front-loaded. Despite the fact, though, that his income will dwindle theoretically along with his production, the fact that there's a full new move clause in effect until the deal's expiration is yet another reason as to why, for me, it's one of the worst. After a slower start to the season though, Jones was able to record 51 points on a struggling team after 78 games played last campaign. Therefore, the worst part about this isn't how Jones is performing now, but rather the length and term as he'll be 35 years old when the deal expires. Also knowing where Chicago is now, considering their obvious objective to rebuild, it's looking like Jones isn't exactly going to be a match for Chicago, say 5 or 6 years down the road. Speaking of D-men who got paid last summer, Darnell Nurse was yet another player in that category. And really, while looking at Nurse's situation in comparison to Jones's, it's quite similar. They're close to the same age and received likely the biggest payouts of their lives with eight-year contracts. The main question with Nurse, however, is and has been, is he truly worthy of being paid like a number one defenseman? While there's no doubt that he can effectively eat minutes and contribute on the score sheet, his defensive game has been more of a concern. Even though he did seem to improve last season, it's hard to tell if he'll remain consistent throughout the entirety of the contract. Similarly to the Jones deal, this one is also front loaded but in contrast has a modified no trade clause for the last three years. Nurse, who tallied 35 points in 71 games played last campaign, is making 12 million in total salary currently this season. Therefore, in comparison, it becomes more understandable as to why, in my opinion, this is a severe overpayment. As you can see by salary alone, Nurse is making as much as his captain Connor McDavid, down to the very penny. 